Well, we are continuing this morning in our series in the book of Kings, the latter half of 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11, reading from verse 14 to 43. This will be our last um, series in the book of Kings for a, a little while. We do intend to pick up uh, the story again, but it won't be for a few months. Uh, next weekend, of course, is Easter. We'll have um, uh, some sermons in John's Gospel over the next couple of weeks. And then we are hoping after Easter to begin a new series in the summer in the book of 1 Peter. But this morning we come to 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse 14. Then the Lord raised up against Solomon an adversary, Hadad the Edomite, from the royal line of Edom. Earlier, when David was fighting with Edom, Joab, the commander of the army, who had gone up to bury the dead, had struck down all the men in Edom. Joab and all the Israelites stayed there for six months until they had destroyed all the men in Edom. But Hadad, only, still only a boy, fled to Egypt with some Edomite officials who had served his father. They set out from Midian and went to Paran. Then, taking people from Paran with them, they went to Egypt to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave Hadad a house and land and provided him with food. Pharaoh was so pleased with Hadad that he gave him a sister of his own wife, Queen Tarphanes, in marriage. The sister of Tarphanes bore him a son named Genubath, whom Tarphanes brought up in the royal palace. There Genubath lived with Pharaoh's own children. While he was in Egypt, Hadad heard that David rested with his ancestors and that Joab, the commander of the army, was also dead. Then Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me go so that I may return to my own country. What have you lacked here that you want to go back to your own country? Pharaoh asked. Nothing, Hadad replied, but do let me go. And God raised up against Solomon another adversary, Rezon, son of Eliada, who had fled from his master, Hadadezer, king of Zobar. When David destroyed Zobar's army, Rezon gathered a band of men around him and became their leader. They went to Damascus, where they settled and took control. Rezon was Israel's adversary as long as Solomon lived, adding to the trouble caused by Hadad. So Rezon ruled in Aram and was hostile towards Israel. Also, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, rebelled against the king. He was one of Solomon's officials, an Ephraimite from Zeredah, and his mother was a widow named Zeruah. Here is the account of how he rebelled against the king. Solomon had built the terraces and had filled in the gap in the wall of the city of David, his father. Now Jeroboam was a man of standing, and when Solomon saw how well the young man did his work, he put him in charge of the whole labour force of the tribes of Joseph. About that time, Jeroboam was going out of Jerusalem, and Ahijah, the prophet of Shiloh, met him on the way, wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone out in the country, and Ahijah took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. Then he said to Jeroboam, take 10 pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I'm going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you 10 tribes. But for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. I will do this because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Molech, the god of the Ammonites, and have not walked in obedience to me, nor done what is right in my eyes, nor kept my decrees and laws as David, Solomon's father, did. But I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David, my servant, whom I chose and who obeyed my commands and decrees. I will take the kingdom from his son's hands and give you ten tribes. I will give one tribe to his son, so that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I chose to put my name. However, as for you, I will take you, and you will rule over all that your heart desires. You will be king over Israel. If you do whatever I command and walk in obedience to me and do what is right in my eyes by obeying my decrees and commands as David my servant did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David. 
and will give Israel to you. I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt to Shishak the king and stayed there until Solomon's death. As for the other events of Solomon's reign, all he did and the wisdom he displayed, are they not written in the book of the annals of Solomon? Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel for 40 years. Then he rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. Hebrews chapter 4 and from verse 14 says this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to, to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus was without sin. As we approach Easter, we could reflect on so many aspects of Christ's character and power and perfection. But this morning, I think that is where our attention ought to be drawn, the moral spotlessness of Jesus, which makes all the difference in the universe. Because sin has consequences. Last week we read in the opening verses of 1 Kings 11 about Solomon's downfall, his sexual proclivity with many foreign women and his inevitable spiritual adultery with abominable foreign gods. And his sin is the woeful trigger for a shift in his story. Solomon's downfall precipitates Solomon's demise. Again, this is a dark chapter, but the darkness ought to leave us longing for the light. From tomorrow, you'll be able to sit in someone else's garden. Now, I suspect 13 months ago, we'd have thought little or nothing about the importance, about the goodness of doing that. But the deprivation of lockdown, well, that increases the delight of normality. And so it is in the Bible story, in the contrast of the kings that we meet along the way. And this morning, my aim is that we let Solomon teach us never to take Christ, he who was without sin. Let us never take Christ for granted. possible, I think, for the, the sinlessness of Jesus to become a thing we know about him and not a truth that causes us to adore him. And if you want to know right up front what you ought to do as a result of this sermon, well, let me tell you, pray and praise. Give thanks to God and give all the glory to his son to the one whose story has no chapter 11. But to feel the hope that is ours in Christ, we must first explore the hopelessness that Israel experienced in the latter days of Solomon. So we need to see what happens as a consequence of Solomon's sin. That is what's described for us in the rest of chapter 11. And there are three main headlines. Firstly, there is peace no more. One of the great marks of Solomon's reign has been the peace which Israel has enjoyed. They've been on good terms with the neighbouring nations. We've been told on numerous occasions about the, the strength of the relationship that Solomon enjoys with the likes of, of Hiram, with the, the Queen of Sheba, even with the Pharaoh of Egypt. Unlike their prior struggles, Solomon's time on the throne has been one of uh, serenity and security. 
It's put like this in chapter 10. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world saw audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God had put in his heart. Year after year, everyone who came brought a gift. Articles of silver and gold, robes, weapons and spices and horses and mules. The world comes to Solomon and pays tribute. But in verses 14 to 25 of chapter 11, we see that in these latter years, this peace is not so sure. Enemies begin to emerge, to oppose Solomon and to threaten Israel. Hadad the Edomite and Rezon the Aramean, Edom to the south, Aram to the north. They both have long, sharpened axes to grind with Israel, grudges dating back to the days of David. We're told in particular, story, in particular detail the, the story of Hadad, just a boy when Eden was defeated by David under the command of, of Joab. Now, if you're with us for our midweek Bible studies last year in 2 Samuel, you might well remember Joab, the particularly ruthless operator. Well, Hadad and a few Edomite officials, it turns out, had fled to Egypt, where the boy has become a man and found great favour in the eyes of Pharaoh. It's almost as if he's become part of the family. And Hadad, who now wants to come back and claim his place in Edom and strike back against Israel. Likewise, we're told much less, but... It's a similar picture, isn't it, with Rezon, who we're told in verse 25 was hostile to Israel. More literally, really, that word means he despised, detested, he loathed Israel. The people have enjoyed rest in the land. But that sweet day is coming to an end. And not simply because of the prospect of aggression from without, but also because of dissension from within. We are headed toward a divided kingdom. That is the second headline here. In verse 11 of the chapter, God has said that he will tear the kingdom away from Solomon and will give it to one of his subordinates. And that's what we see begin to come to pass in verse 26. 41. Jeroboam is one of Solomon's officials. He's been instrumental in the building of Jerusalem. And maybe he was the official in charge of oversized wine bottles. Who knows? We're not told about that. But Jeroboam is told by Ahijah, the prophet, what is to happen. In fact, he's not just told, is he? He's shown. Ahijah waylays Jeroboam on his journey. He takes off his lovely new jacket. And then he starts tearing it to pieces. Who knows what Jeroboam makes of this, but soon enough he has 12 pieces of fabric laid out before him. And Ahijah says, okay, take 10. Maybe at this point Jeroboam is thinking to himself, my goodness, they're a strange lot, aren't they, these prophets? But then he is given the explanation for the illustration. Take 10 pieces for yourself, says verse 31, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. See, I'm gonna tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand and give you 10 tribes. But for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, he will have one tribe. I will do this because they have forsaken me. Just as the, the torn robe of Samuel signaled the demise of the kingdom of Saul. Well, so now, agonizingly, Solomon's kingdom will go the same way. In fact, in a, in a worse way, not simply torn from Solomon, but torn apart. Ten tribes, which will become the, the northern kingdom of Israel on the one hand, and just one. 
Judah, as it will be remaining in the hands of the Davidic dynasty. Now, I know, I know the mass doesn't add up. Two tribes will be left uh, because the tribe of Benjamin was, was tied to the city of Jerusalem. So we're in 32 where God says, but for the sake of my servant David and the city of Jerusalem, which I have chosen, Benjamin is kind of included uh, within that. I think I think that's how it works. The author hasn't seen fit to bore us at this stage with the intricacies of all that. So I won't either. But that is what Jeroboam is told. And Jeroboam is impatient for his portion of land and people. And so it is that the disintegration starts in Solomon's day. Jeroboam, son of Nebat, rebelled against the king. In verse 26, and then by the end, verse 40, Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt, to Shishak the king, and stayed there until Solomon's death. Again, I think we're to hear miserable echoes of Saul and of Exodus in reverse. The precious, delightful unity that has been enjoyed in the land. Well, it is all crumbling. And then the third headline is what we find at the very end of the chapter. There is peace no more. It is now a divided kingdom. And we end with Solomon dead and buried. And the way that it's told to us there in verses 41 to 43, I think the, the agony is emphasised. As for the other events of Solomon's reign, all he did and the wisdom he displayed, are they not written in the book of the annals of Solomon? Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel for 40 years. And he rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David, his father. As verses report for us Solomon's death, they will become a formulaic refrain throughout the book of Kings. But for the king who was the best, the king who displayed such wisdom, whose reign was over all Israel, such unity, so happy and glorious, the king who you might at times have thought could see, could maybe even be the fulfilment of the promise given to his father David, an eternal and everlasting kingdom. Well, those verses are a sorry reminder. They are a grim full stop. So that is what happens. The demise of Solomon, the downward trajectory of his kingdom. But why? Why does it happen? I mean, sometimes sin has obvious direct consequences. If you drive down Marsh Lane at 100 miles an hour, then you might expect it at best to find yourself with a pretty hefty fine, or maybe even banned from driving for a little while, or at worst, you might find that you're responsible for a very serious accident. That wrong action has a, a direct and obvious consequence. My favourite biblical example of that kind of cause and effect is uh, found in Proverbs chapter 6, so directly kind of connected to, uh, to Solomon and his wisdom. And in Proverbs 6, the father warns his son against adultery, and he does so essentially by saying, look, if you sleep with another man's wife, then you ought to expect that the other fellow will come around and give you a darn good beating. Simple. Sin, consequence. Cause, effect. But this isn't like that, is it? In 1 Kings 11, what unfolds here isn't as a direct result of his marriages or his rank idolatry. Those things um, aren't mentioned at all in the motivation of, uh, of Hadad or, or Rezor, for example. They aren't the, the spark that prompts Jeroboam's rebellion. So why does it happen? 
while the author is in no doubt and wants us to be in no doubt either. Verse 14, then the Lord raised up against Solomon an adversary. Verse 23, and God raised up against Solomon another adversary. Verse 31, take 10 pieces for yourself, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. See, I am going to tear the kingdom out of Solomon's hand. This is the Lord's doing. These things happen because Yahweh sovereignly over, oversees to it such that they do. Solomon's demise is, is brought about because Yahweh decrees it so. And the one who rules over all things and who knows from the end and who knows the end from the beginning while well, he is able and he is right to do so. He's able because he's the Lord of history. There's no record of any particular obvious divine action or intervention in the case of, of Hadad or Rezor. They receive no word. They see no vision. For all we know, they know nothing of Yahweh. And whatever they do know, they certainly don't honour him. And yet in the unfolding story of their lives, well, they are tools of his divine will. If you ask them what they're about, well, I suppose they might have said, avenging my, my family and people, claiming the power and victory, strength and honour. I don't know. But for us, that the curtain of history's story is pulled back. The Lord has raised them up as adversaries for his fallen, faithless, foolish king. In the case of Jeroboam, of course, it's even more clear. A word of prophecy is the prompt for his rebellion. Now, that rebellion, I think, in the way that it unfolds, is misguided. He's told that Solomon will remain king and that it will be in the days of his son that he will be given the ten tribes. He's told that clearly in verses 34 and 35. And yet it seems that Jeroboam is not prepared to wait upon God's timing. He's no David trusting in the Lord's plans while Saul remains on the throne. So Jeroboam is not without fault, but yet in his greed, he is used by God to bring strife upon Solomon in his waning days. Solomon's downfall is Solomon's doing. But the demise that it precipitates is all in the Lord's hands. Just as we might note Solomon's glory days were. Solomon's successes and Israel's security, they never rested upon Solomon's innate ability, nor were they built upon the fickle foundation of of Pharaoh or any other human power or alliance. No, in fact, of course, we learn here in this chapter that Pharaoh, just as he's given his daughter's hand in marriage to Solomon, has given his sister's in law, his sister in law's hand to Solomon's enemy. And Solomon's enemy's son raised in his own home. No, put not your trust in princes. In the golden days and in the dark ones. Yahweh rules. As Job puts it, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now I believe this is utterly true and vitally good, but it is also often for us a, a troubling sort of truth that God would in his sovereignty work like this to bring foes and fracture and the finality of the grave 
that we must see that God here in 1 Kings 11 is absolutely faithful in his sovereign action. He doesn't act out of vindictiveness. There's nothing quick or sharp or, or petty about it, but only perfectly in accord with what he had said. And tragically, in accord with what Solomon knew. It is Solomon who spoke these words at the dedication of the temple, when your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against you. Solomon knew the consequences only too well. And it is just what God had said when he'd made those majestic covenantal promises to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son when he does wrong. I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. Parents often find themselves saying, I'm sorry, but I told you that's what would happen. Children who have rules brought in out of the blue and punishments sprung upon them, well, maybe they can cry foul and unfair. But not those who in love are warned and given every opportunity and afforded every good thing. What does it show us that God would do this? What lesson do we learn? Well, that obedience to his commands is the way to life and blessing. It is the only way. That was the measure set before Solomon by his father David back in chapter 2. David says to Solomon, I'm about to go the way of all the earth, so be strong. Act like a man and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. We said then that God's word will provide the only meaningful measure of, uh, of Solomon. And by that measure, well, again, verse 11 earlier in the chapter, the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you. It's not merely the measure by which Solomon will be measured, but every king who will come after him. It's what's told to Jeroboam. Even in verse 38, if you do whatever I command and walk in obedience to me and do what is right in my eyes by obeying my decrees and commands as David, my servant, did, I will be with you. I will build you a dynasty as enduring as the one I built for David and will give Israel to you. Solomon knew. And so Yahweh must in his sovereign faithfulness, set in train the events of 1 Kings 11. Because Solomon knew, and we must know, that only by walking with God and in keeping his word is there life and blessing. So that is what happens. That is why it happens. As we come to a close, are we to be left in despair? What hope here? Well, it turns out, great, certain hope, grounded in two things. Firstly, there is hope in God's promises. 
Ahijah says to Jeroboam, verse 34, but I will, sorry, God says through Ahijah to Jeroboam, but I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I have made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of, my, of David, my servant, whom I chose and who obeyed my commands and decrees. I will take the kingdom from his son's hand and give you 10 tribes. I will give one tribe to his son so that David, my servant, may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem, the city where I chose to put my name. The scope of the severance of Solomon's kingdom is restrained. The kingdom will be torn and divided, but not in its entirety taken away. One tribe will be left. Now that may not seem very much, but with God, very little is everything he needs. And he has given his word. David will always have a lamp before him in Jerusalem because God has chosen. He has signed and sealed. He has put his name to it. Solomon's folly does not negate God's faithfulness. And then verse 39, I will humble David's descendants because of this, but not forever. The scope of the severance of Solomon's kingdom is restrained and the time of curse as a consequence for sin is limited. It will not last forever. Because the promise to bless and to bring blessing through one of David's descendants, well, that promise is everlasting. There is hope amidst the tragedy of Solomon's demise because of God's promises. They have his word. The verse for the year uh, that we have here at the chapel is taken from Psalm 130. Psalm 130, verse 5. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. By saying there that we put our hope in his word, we're not saying, well, our hope is in kind of the Bible itself. If there's something magic about the text, no, it is in God's promise. He has given his word. It's in the word of, of power by which the universe was created and promise by which history is dictated. There is hope in God's word. And as we survey the wreckage that Solomon will leave in his wake, well, how keenly we feel the assurance of hope that is ours in the obedience of Jesus Christ. He is the servant of Isaiah chapter 50. The servant who can sing the song, the sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. Jesus is the one who hears God's instruction and is perfectly obedient to it. He does not forsake. He does not, like Solomon, turn his back. Again, I've been struck more and more over this past couple of years. We preached through Luke's gospel not so long ago. And I just keep coming back to the absolutely foundational, the miraculous importance of what happens in Luke chapter 4. Where Jesus is tempted 
by Satan, tested in the wilderness. As a, a new Israel, will Jesus succeed where all those who have gone before him, where Solomon, even Israel's greatest king, have failed? Here's one of the temptations, Luke 4 from verse 5. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Solomon at this point in the story says, oh yeah, I'd like more. And what is a bit of worship of another God? Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Temptation of Jesus is, it's not miraculous fireworks, but it is a work that only God can do. Jesus will not worship another. He will not trade his relationship with his father for all the kingdoms in the world. He only ever and always walks in obedience to God and does what is right in his eyes. Obedient, as we remember next weekend, even to the point of death. And so there is hope. The storyline of history will not have a 1 Kings 11. There will be no folly, no downfall, no demise. The kingdom of Jesus will be no golden era, it will be a golden eternity. Because he is the one greater than Solomon. He is the promised forever king. And he is all our hope and delight now and evermore. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for our Lord and Saviour and King. We praise you that where Solomon was disobedient, where his, his kingdom disintegrated, Christ listened and followed and obeyed perfectly. We thank you that therefore his kingdom is secure and certain, and that by his sinless obedience, our place in it is sure. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that we have learnt from Solomon. but please keep our eyes fixed upon Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Solomon is one, in the end, sadly defined by sin. And were it not for Christ, well, such would be our story. But though our sins are many, God's mercy is more. That's our final hymn this morning, which you'll find just below.